All right, this morning our text, if you're uh, following along in the Bible, is in Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, that's a little hot up here on the stage, if you could turn the monitors back, if that's what I'm hearing, I'm not sure. Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 12. Give you a little bit of background before we actually get into the text. The book of Revelation is, is a little controversy about the date that the book of Revelation was written. Um, a, a little controversy. There's some references in the book of Revelation that make scholars uncertain about exactly the time that was written. I favor a late dating, uh, around 90 A.D. I believe it occurred uh, as the church was entering into the Neronian persecution and was starting to experience uh, some of the early stages of uh, persecution of the Christian faith, the organized official persecution of the faith. And the context of the book of Revelation, of course, is that John himself has been the recipient of some of that persecution. Um, he has been taken into custody by the Romans, by the Roman authorities who want to silence his voice. He's a very influential uh, apostolic preacher and teacher uh, throughout the region of Asia Minor. And uh, they have taken him into custody. And legend has it, we don't know this for certain, but legend has it that they attempted to kill him in several different ways, and one of the stories that's told is that they tried to boil him alive in a pot of boiling water or boiling oil, and that when they took him out, he was unharmed. And uh, it scared them so badly <laughs> that they didn't know what to do with him. Uh, so they took him to a place that was reserved for the worst of criminals, a place where they abandoned criminals to basically live on their own and die, the island of Patmos which in those days was a windswept, barren place. Nobody lived there. And they took uh, the Apostle John and they dumped him there. And they left him to die. And it's here on this island that he receives the book that we title The Revelation of Jesus Christ. He literally receives from Jesus a revelation of himself, of who Jesus truly is. And it's an amazing book. It's a book that... Uh, is filled with wondrous visions and stories, and it's a book that leaves people, uh, I think a lot of times a lot of people read it, it leaves them confused or baffled as to what the meaning is. Uh, but, but please, don't allow your, um, your confusion, if you will, to cause you to, to keep you from reading the book of Revelation. It is a powerful, powerful book. There is so much there that we can learn. And in the opening chapters of the book of Revelation, it starts... And it says that John was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, okay? So he wasn't uh, on, the island of Revel uh, on the island of Patmos complaining that God had dumped him there and had abandoned him. Instead, it says that on the Lord's day, he was in the Spirit. He was worshiping, okay? And as he worshiped, the Spirit of God began to speak to him, and he began to hear the, the voice of the Lord. And it said he heard a voice coming from behind him that was so real that he turned around and looked to see who it was, and this is where the revelation of Jesus Christ begins. He sees Jesus in his glorified form. Okay? And Jesus begins to speak to him. And over the course of the next couple of chapters, Jesus is speaking to John a message, a specific message. Now, if you'll notice, if you look in your Bible, those words are in red. The words that are in red are where Jesus is actually verbalizing. He's speaking to John. That's why we put those words in red. And the words that Jesus speaks are messages to the seven churches of Asia Minor. Now, the reason that's significant historically is because John was to those churches as Paul was to the churches to the West, okay? As Paul was to the Greek churches and to the churches around Rome, so John was to the churches of Asia Minor. He was an apostolic messenger to them, okay? So these were people that John knew. The people that Jesus is talking to in these messages were people that John was intimately acquainted with. Many of the people in these churches, John had led them to Christ himself personally, okay, or had been directly involved in their discipleship, in their mentoring. He knew each one of these churches intimately. So as Jesus begins to speak, it's not just some abstract word, okay? It is word being given. It's a word being given to each of these churches that John had invested his life in, okay? You can well imagine John's feeling here. He's stuck out on the island of Patmos, left there to die. He has, he's cut off from contact with these young churches 
these baby Christians who've just been born again, just been saved, just been translated into the kingdom of God. They are surrounded by the pagan world. They have no Bible. Please understand that. The New Testament church had no Bible. Half of the Bible hadn't even been written yet, okay? And the other half, they didn't have copies of available to them. They had no Bible. John was one of their lifelines to the Scripture, and he's stuck on this island, isolated from them. Imagine the anxiety, right? Paul talks about that, doesn't he? While he's in prison, he says, you have no idea the anxiety, the burden, the pressure, the care that I feel for all of the churches. Because all of these churches have basically been abandoned out there. Good luck to you. Your leaders, the, the philosophy of the Romans early on in the persecution was cut off the head and the body will die. They took away their leadership and threw them in prison, right? So here are all these young Christians who don't know the word. They're floundering. They're struggling. They're assailed from every side, and John is out here isolated on this island and can't get to them. That's a form of torture in and of itself, isn't it? Now, that's why I believe that when Jesus appears to him, the first words Jesus speaks are to these churches, not to John. It's to these churches. It's to let, it's, it, it serves a twofold purpose. One, it is to encourage, rebu- rebuke, and correct those churches, but it's also to comfort John, okay, so that he knows that these churches are in the care of someone greater than him. Amen? That these churches are still in the care of the great pastor, the shepherd of the sheep. That Jesus has not forgotten the churches that John has poured his life into. That he is still intimately involved in their lives and he has a word to speak to them. Now today, I felt like the Lord impressed upon me to focus on one of those churches in particular. Okay? And that is the, church, the message to the church at Pergamum. The message to the church at Pergamum. So I want to start off reading this text. It says, to the angel or the messenger of the church in Pergamum write the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and engage in sexual immorality. So you have some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent. For if not, I will come to you soon, and I will war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers or overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on that stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Okay? Let's start talking about where the church of Pergamum is and why it's significant. You'll notice in the text, in a couple of places there, he says, You live where Satan dwells. Did you notice that? The reason that jumps out to you is because that's kind of a strange expression. You know, I know where you live. Now, I expect that God does know where I live, don't you? And that God knows where you live. God knows that I live at 1252 Macedonia Church Road. And that right now I'm at 1275 Tasker Road. So, of course, God knows where I am. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, I know the place where you are. I know Pergamum, okay? I know that it's the place where Satan dwells. What does that phrase mean, where Satan dwells? Well, it's it's really interesting. Pergamum was, first of all, a center of pagan worship. Today, there's a city still standing there. Uh, In fact, most of Asia Minor is part of what we call uh, Turkey today, modern-day Turkey. Uh, There's a city still standing there. Today, that city is called Bergamo. Today, that city is ruled by Islam, okay? But towering above the city of Bergama, it's right on a harbor overlooking the sea, towering above the city of Bergama is a mountain. And on the top of that mountain are the only remains left of ancient Pergamum. 
This once great city of the Roman Empire has long ago, many centuries ago, crumbled into dust. The only thing remaining of the ancient ruins of Pergamum stands on a mountain overlooking the city. And the reason that was preserved was because at one time it was the largest temple of pagan worship in the entire Roman Empire. Larger even than the Parthenon. A gigantic temple that occupied the entire top of the mountain. In fact, right next to that temple is a, an amphitheater that is almost as large as as the amphitheater on Mars Hill in Athens, okay? It's a gigantic site, and it was a place where pagan worship took place practically 24-7. Not only was there one great temple there, there were actually two built side by side. One of those temples was to Zeus, okay? Now, I don't know you know the significance of Zeus to the, to the pagan people of that day, but Zeus was the Mac Daddy of the gods, Okay? He was where all the other gods came from. All the other gods were godlings compared to Zeus. Okay? Zeus was the father of the gods. He was above all the other gods. And so there was a magnificent temple to him. There was also a magnificent temple built to Aeschylus. Now, how many of you ever heard of the god Aeschylus? Anybody? Nobody? Nobody? Anybody in here a doctor, a physician? Anybody know a doctor? Okay, right? You've seen the symbol, no doubt, of the medical profession, haven't you? What is the symbol of the medical profession? It's a snake wrapped around a pole. You ever seen that? Okay. Many people mistakenly think that's taken from the Old Testament. The rod that, that Moses carried or the staff that they lifted up and, and the bronze serpent was wrapped around it. But that's not correct. It's actually the symbol of the god Aeschylus the serpent god of the Roman Empire, who was the god of healing and of medicine. And it was believed that if you ascended the mountain above Pergamum and you went into this great temple that they had built to this serpent god, isn't it interesting they're worshiping a serpent, you know, and that he's the source of healing, right? If you went into this great temple that had been built to Aeschylus and if you laid down prostrate on the floor and you lay there and slept there overnight, that the spirit of the serpent would come and infuse your body and you would be healed from whatever disease you bore. Okay? Uh, to say this was a center of pagan worship is putting it mildly, isn't it? This was a place where pagan worship went on all the time and everything that went along with pagan worship, which included ritual sexual practices. In fact, the city Pergamum, the name Pergamum, are you ready for this? Hold on to your hat. It means per, means like from perversion to twist, twisted, right? Gamum, the, the last part, means marriage. Perverted marriage. You getting the picture? You understand what was going on there? That's what it means. <laughs> it was a center of all kinds of sexual, pagan sexual immorality. But I, I actually do not believe that that's the reason why Jesus designates it as the place where Satan dwells. As bad as all of that was, I really don't think that was the reason. I believe the reason he calls it that is because of one other distinction. Pergamum was the first place to enforce emperor worship. It was the first place to enforce the worship of the emperor as a god. Now, please understand, okay? The Romans had been worshiping their emperors for, as gods for a long time before now, before this time in the Bible, before the first century of Christianity. They had worshiped their emperors, believing that their emperors were demigods, the, the product of, of a god and, a, and a, of, a, of a male god and a female human getting together. They believed that their emperors were descended from that lineage and had believed so for a long time, and they worshiped their emperors as sons of the gods. So this was nothing new. What is new is that in Pergamum, it becomes official policy. You need to understand this, okay? This is a crucial, crucial part of this message. It's very crucial. You need to pay attention to this part, okay? If I could get down there in your face and say, listen to what I'm about to say, okay? The Roman Empire started 
One of the foundational principles of the Roman Empire was religious freedom. I don't know if you're aware of that. Most of the other empires and great kingdoms that surrounded them were extremely religiously intolerant. You either worshipped their god or the alternative was we kill you. Have a nice day, okay? You can either convert to worship our god or you're dead. The Roman Empire took a completely different approach. They said, we can tolerate the worship of any god. You can worship whatever you want to. You can worship Zeus. You can worship Apollos. You can worship Aeschylus. You can worship the trees or the rocks. For that matter, you can even belong to this obscure Jewish sect that worships this man they claim raised from the dead named Jesus if you want to. We're okay with that. Theirs was a policy of absolute neutrality as far as religious freedom is concerned. In fact, you couldn't have picked a better environment for Christianity to to take root and to grow than the Roman Empire. They were the, uh, up, up to that point in history, they were the most religiously tolerant people on the face of the earth. It was a perfect hothouse environment for Christianity to explode. Are you hearing me? Therefore, Satan's primary strategy was going to be to put a stop to that. He could not allow that kind of religious tolerance to continue. He had to figure out a way to make tolerance into intolerance. Otherwise, Christianity was going to take over. It was going to own the Roman Empire before long. Okay? This was a place where you were free to worship whatever God you wanted to, and these Christians were the newest sect of of some strange religion, but they were growing like mad. And the reason they were growing like mad, my friends, is because they had the power of the Holy Spirit. People were being converted in large numbers. And the enemy standing here watching this, and he said, if this continues down this path, I'll never be able to stop the growth of this sect. Okay? That's why it's so significant that Pergamum is the place where emperor worship became official policy. You say, why did emperor worship, which had been going on for hundreds of years before that, suddenly become official policy you're required to worship the emperor? Very simple. It became a test of patriotic loyalty. It became a test of patriotic loyalty. You either worship the emperor or you were not a good Roman citizen. If you could not offer worship to the emperor, who was, after all, a descendant of the gods, and it's from the emperor that all of our rights come, all of our rights are granted to us by him, we live at his good pleasure. He gives us this great and wonderful democratic society that we have, right? All of the principles and ideals of the Roman Empire, he he is the physical embodiment. He's the representative on earth of all the ideals of the Roman Empire. Therefore, if you were a true patriotic Roman citizen, you should have no problem showing your allegiance to the empire and to the emperor by offering him worship. And every one of you in here should be going, wow, bells are ringing. Lights are going on. Okay? We're living in those days. We are reliving that history. And you say, Pastor Don, I don't believe that. Well, okay, don't believe it. I'll give you about 10 more years, and then I'll check back with you and ask you if you believe it now. Okay? We are reliving that history. History is recurring. Because just as they were required to swear an oath of fealty to the emperor, and if you could not swear an oath of fealty to the emperor, therefore you were not regarded as as a true Roman citizen in the same way we are slowly but surely substituting the state for God. And trust me, when that process is complete, they will demand worship. They will demand worship. If you don't believe it, wait and see. If you don't believe it, wait and see. Okay? They demanded that people worship the emperor. Now, let me tell you something. It was benign. It was benign. They didn't make you go into a temple and prostrate yourself before an image of the emperor and grovel before him. No, no, no. They made it easy for you. 
They made it convenient to be an emperor worshiper. Like driving through at McDonald's. They made it easy. They bent over backward to make it as easy as they possibly could. Why? Because they knew they had all these people of all these diverse, different religious backgrounds. So the only way in which to appease the principle of emperor worship while at the same time keeping all those people of various religions happy was to make it just very, very simple. All you had to do when you went by the temple, pinch a little piece of incense, burn it in the fire, and you were completed with your obligation. That's all you had to do. That's all you had to do. You had to publicly show your loyalty by burning incense to the emperor's image. You know what the Christians said? Nope. Not going to do it. We don't owe our loyalty to him. We owe our loyalty to a higher power that stands above him. Our loyalty is to the king above all kings, to the lord above all lords, to the emperor of emperors. We will not offer worship to a man. So the Roman authorities said, wow, what are we going to do about these Christians? You can read all this stuff. They've got, there, there's letters where they wrote back and forth to one another trying to figure out what they were going to do about the Christians. You know what they came up with? They came up with another compromise. They said, we'll write a letter. If you will forswear that your ultimate loyalty is to the emperor, we will write a letter on your behalf saying, guess what? It's a get-out-of-jail-free letter. It's a letter saying, yes, this good citizen of Rome has forsworn their, their, their loyalty to the emperor, and therefore they are not required to offer incense to the image of the emperor because they have given an oath of their loyalty. You know what they called that letter? It was called libella, and it's the word that we get, it's where we get the word libel from. The Christians labeled it as slander. They would not sign the letters. Nope, not going to do it. We worship a king that is above your king. We worship a lord that is above your lord. You hear me? We worship an emperor that is above your emperor. We will not sign this letter. All you've got to do is sign this letter. It's simple. Just put your signature here, and it's all over, and we'll never bother you again. Wow. And the early Christians said, no. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name. And you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Not only did they refuse, but they held out unto death. He even names the name of a man who is unknown to us. We don't know who he was. We don't know what his significance was in the church. Sorry, if you want to get the limelight, that's not the way the kingdom of God works. Antipas is just some unknown dude who stood up and said, nope, not going to do it. And they said, what are we going to do? And he just said, I guess you'll just have to kill me. And they said, okay. And they killed him. And he said, you did not deny my faith. Even in the days when they martyred Antipas, you still stood strong. How many of you know that that is a rousing commendation from the word from the lips of Jesus? Would you agree with me? I, I would say that that is a commendation of faithfulness. That's like, that's like having a medal pinned on your chest by the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You did good. You stood faithful in the midst of a terrible time of pressure. When you were being pressured to cave in, you stood faithful. I would say, to be honest with you, they did better than most American churches would do. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you agree with me? Wouldn't you agree that under that kind of pressure, most Americans would just go, well, it's just a little signature. What's it going to hurt? You know? I mean, I'm not really worshiping President whoever, you know? I'm not, I'm, and by the way, this isn't anti-Obama. This is just, this is anti anyone who claims power that stands above God, whoever it is, Republican or Democrat, okay? And he says, and, he, and, and, and we would say to ourselves, oh, it's just a little compromise. It'll be okay. It'll be okay. I'll just sign my name. It'll be all right. These guys wouldn't do it. They were so devoted to Jesus, they said, no, 
we will not do it. But unfortunately, the text doesn't stop there. He said, but I have something against you. Those are sad words. You don't want to hear those words from the mouth of Jesus. I have a problem with you. Here's the problem you have among you. You have among you. Notice he doesn't say you. He says you have among you. I'm going to quit preaching now, and I'm going to start meddling. So I'll just warn you ahead of time. Uh, this might be a good time for you to check out and start thinking about the reruns of your favorite show or go to the bathroom or something because I'm getting ready to, we're getting ready to hammer, okay? The Jesus hammer is coming out, okay? He is addressing the fact that this church, this church is doing good. You guys, this church is a church that's standing in the midst of pressure and persecution, and he says, but you have in your midst, you have people among you, that are doing things that I don't approve of. Wow. You know? The time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and sinners appear? Jesus is about cleaning his house. Okay? Jesus is about cleaning his house. I'm going to say something, and because I'm associate pastor, I can say it and get away with it. There are people that need to leave this church. There are people that need to leave this church. It's a fact. And I can say that honestly about every church in Winchester. Because there are people there that are hindering the movement of the Holy Spirit through their attitude, through their behavior, through their actions, through their rebellion against leadership. I could go on and on. I could list a laundry list. There are people that need to leave those churches. If Jesus were here, he would say the same thing. I commend you. You stand faithfully for the word of God. You stand fast in the midst of societal pressure. I'm glad you're doing it, but I have something against you. You have people there. You have people there that are keeping that church from reaching its full potential. Now, I know you don't believe that, so I'm going to illustrate it to you from Scripture, okay? <clears throat> the tendency among us is to think that God judges us as individuals. So as long as my heart's right and as long as my family's right, then everything's all right with the world. No, that's not how it works. The church, this body, is judged corporately not individually, okay? Joshua enters the land of Canaan, goes up against this big giant city, this walled city, this powerful city. Those of you youth that were in my Sunday school class, you know we talked about that this morning, right? The city of Jericho, a city so powerful that no man could overthrow it. Walls so thick, people lived inside it. This place was a fortress, man. Nobody getting in there. God says, I've got a strategy for getting in there. March around the city and blow horns. What? What are you talking about? Watch around the city and blow horns. How many of you know that most of us would have said, God, you're cuckoo, man. Those walls are, are 100 feet thick, and you're telling us to march around the city and blow horns? March around the city and blow horns. So they marched around the city and they blowed horns. You know what happened? Those walls crumbled into dust. It says that they marched up in rows into that city and killed every pagan in that city they marched up by rows there was nothing to stop them on to the next city AI AI is a little is up a little branch up at the end of a canyon it's not very well defended because it's surrounded by mountains and besides Jericho's down at the mouth of the canyon so they didn't have to defend themselves because they had Jericho to protect them guess what we ain't got no Jericho no more Right? The Israelites are advancing up this little dead end canyon toward this town. And Joshua says, Who's going to go with me? And the guy and, the, and, his, and, his fight, and his fighting men, who, by the way, were just ragtag Israelites, they weren't trained warriors. Proof of that's getting ready to happen in just a second, okay? 
they're going up there, and they said, we don't need everybody. Just send a couple back. <laughs> this place is small. We can take this place easily. They went up, and the men of Ai came out and beat them so bad that they chased them all the way back down the canyon into the plains of Jezreel. They killed 36 and wounded God knows how many others. Joshua fell on his face. Good place to be at that moment. But you know what Joshua says? He said, God's what's wrong with you. You know what God said back to him? He said, Joshua, ain't nothing wrong with me. Get up on your feet. He said, there is compromise in your camp. Someone has held back. Remember the city of Jericho? I told you that everything that was silver, gold, bronze, all the precious metals of that city were to be kept and to put into the treasury for the house of the Lord, for the temple that will one day be built. And I intend for every, in, every ounce of that material to go toward a temple that I'm going to dedicate for my worship. And it is set aside. It is devoted unto the Lord. And no one is to touch it. One guy. You hear me? One man named Achan took some of it and hid it. And because of him, 36 men are dead, countless others wounded, and the Israelites are fleeing before their enemies. One person. Are you getting my drift? It took one person to defeat the Israelites. One man who was compromised. Just one. The Apostle Paul in the New Testament, you say, well, that was Old Testament, Pastor Don. How about some of the New Covenant stuff? Well, let me give you some New Testament. The Apostle Paul says that when the, when the people, when the church comes together, he said there's a problem here. He said because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Now, any of you who are cooks, you know what he's talking about, right? You take a little bit of that yeast, stick it in that flatbread, and that flatbread's not flatbread anymore. It expands and it rises. And he says there's a problem. He said many are sick among you and many are dead because there's compromise in your fellowship. He didn't say everybody in the church was compromised, did he? He said, no, there's leaven. There's the influence of sin in your camp. You see, God, his vision of the church, very different from ours. Very different from ours. His vision of the church is an army united in the power of the Holy Spirit, bonded together by, by, the, by the chains of the love of Christ that bonds them together like a family moving forward in Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the vision Jesus has for the church. Like a mighty army, he used to sing it, moves the church of God. Okay? That's the vision Jesus has for the church. Instead of, what's wrong with the pastor? Why is he driving that car? Why is the carpet so dirty? You know? Why are the walls stained? Why is this? Why is that? Uh, 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 griping, complaining, fighting against one another over petty stuff. Petty stuff. Stuff that doesn't matter. Do you, do you really think Jesus is going to care about 90% of the stuff that we get so bent out of shape with one another over? In the final analysis, on the day of judgment, is God going to say to me, now, Don, about that time when brother so-and-so didn't hold his mouth right when he spoke to you, we're going to sit that straight today. No! It's so petty, and yet we are divided one against the other. Listen, I have a few things against you. You have some there. You have some there. Now, let's go on and see what those some were about who hold the teaching of Balaam. They taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Now, we don't know a whole lot about the Nicolaitans, but we know who their leader was. And it was a man named Nikolai. That's how, that's how they came to have the name the Nicolaitans. Okay? And here's basically what he taught. He said this. He said, we are saved. Our spirit and our soul is saved. Eternally saved. We can't be separated from God. There's nothing that can happen that can separate my saved spirit and soul from God. But our flesh, it's evil and corrupt. And it can never, ever, ever be redeemed. Therefore, it doesn't really matter what your flesh does. 
long as your spirit and soul are saved. Now, you say, Pastor Don, I would never believe that kind of stuff. Well, you know, what's really odd is a lot of people live like they believe that. i got to tell you something. Your flesh is destined for redemption. Your flesh is going to be saved. Do you hear me? The last enemy to be defeated is death. Your flesh is going to be raised from the dead, glorified. Okay? You, your whole man, spirit, soul, and body is meant to be sanctified unto the Lord. Okay? These people were being taught that basically, hey, since it's your flesh and your flesh is evil, there's nothing you can do about it. Sexual immorality is okay. It's okay. Well, Pastor Don, I don't believe that. Well, wow. Could have fooled me. I talk to your kids. I know what goes on in school. I know what's happening. I'm sorry. I know what's happening. And there are people out there who truly believe they're born again, they're saved, they're going to heaven, and they're indulging their flesh in all kinds of sinful behavior. We may not, from the pulpit, proclaim the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, but many in the pew are living like the Nicolaitans. Judgment must begin at the house of God. Okay? And as long as that continues, as long as that continues, we say, I want revival. Not going to happen. Not going to happen until there's genuine repentance. God, I want you to move. I want you to heal the sick. I want you to raise the dead. I want to see us cast out demons. I want to do the stuff they did in the New Testament. So do I. So do I. I do too. I want to see it too. Look around you. You see a whole lot of it going on? You say, well, you know, some churches, I love the churches that excuse that stuff by saying, well, that was for back then. Hmm. Hadn't read that in my Bible. I've read the Bible from cover to cover. Best I can figure, we should still be doing the same deeds. In fact, Mark chapter 16 says, These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out demons. They shall speak in new tongues. They shall take up serpents and not be harmed. By the way, that doesn't mean the silly practice of putting snakes in a box and waving around a church. Okay? It's basically saying that as long as you're in the stream of what God is doing, you can be immune from the attacks of the enemy, right? If the church is where the church is supposed to be. I'm just saying, read your New Testament. Do you not read your New Testament sometimes as a Christian and get disappointed? I do. I read it and I compare it to what I see and I go, what's the matter? What's wrong? Am I failing somehow, God? Am I missing the mark? What am I doing? Show me what I'm doing. Let me cleanse my life. But then I start talking to Christians, and I find out what's going on. They're bent out of joint with one another over something that somebody said, or they're mad about something over here at this church, or they're angry over there, and they're divided four ways from Sunday. And everybody's got their pet doctrine. I'm a Calvinist. I'm an Arminian. You know, I'm this, I'm that, you know. And we're divided a hundred different ways. And when you actually talk about Christians getting together to pray for our community, you can't get 15 people to show up. And yet they're so concerned that their children are going to hell and their schools are gone down the toilet, but you can't get the people to pray. What in the world? Like a mighty army, lose the church of God is almost a joke. It's almost a joke. You have among you those who hold to this teaching. Therefore, repent. Now, let me suggest to you what that means. Okay? Think about this text for just a minute. He's writing to people and telling them, you have people among you. Therefore, I'm holding you accountable for people among you. He's not writing to the people who hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, is he? He's writing to people who tolerate the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, isn't he? Notice the tone of the letter. It's not written to people who are believing the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, no. It's written to Christians who are looking the other way while the doctrine of the Nicolaitans is being proclaimed right among them. Is that, would you not agree? Is that what the context seems to indicate? He's not writing to Christians who believe it. He's writing to Christians who are allowing it. 
Therefore, how do you repent from that? Somebody tell me. Bingo! We have a winner. Thank you, Josh. We have a winner. You kick them out. You put them out of your fellowship. Wow, that's harsh. Sorry. Go to First and Second Corinthians, and you'll see the Apostle Paul gives the remedy for that kind of thing there. He says, first you go to them one-on-one. If they won't listen to you, then you go back to them with church elders. If they won't listen to you and the church elders, then you take it before the church. And if they won't listen to the entire church, then you put them out of your fellowship. Wow. See, I'm just, I'll just say this, okay? Stick my neck out again, and like I'm not already. I'll stick my neck out again and tell you this, okay? The Bible is the cure for a lot of our foolishness today. If we would just do what it says. If we would just do what it says. Paul says, I love this, Paul says to the Ephesians, he says, to the unruly among you, I say this, I'm coming. And he says, would you rather me come with gentleness or with a rod? And I don't think that those are empty words. Now, I don't think it literally means Paul's going to take the paddle and paddle a bunch of adults, okay? Who knows? Maybe. Maybe they need it, right? But I do believe it means that Paul, when he gets there, is going to exercise church discipline as an apostolic commander in the army of God. And he's going to go face-to-face with these people and say, what's going on? And if he can't get it resolved, they're gone. You know? They're gone. Listen to me. Everything, everything that God wants to do in this city depends on the state of the church. It does not depend on the state of Jesus. Jesus is in a mind to change this place, to turn this place upside down. Jesus is of that mind. Do you understand me? Jesus is of the same mind he was in the New Testament. In the New Testament, it says everywhere these guys went, it said, these are the men who've turned the world upside down. They've come here also. Can you imagine people being scared of our church? To where if we went somewhere, they would say, that's that church that's turning the world upside down, oh, my Lord. What are we going to do? Right? Imagine that. Imagine being that kind of church. That's the church that Jesus wants. And if it's not happening, it's not Jesus fault if it's not happening it's not Jesus fault the disconnect is not with Jesus can I get an amen from somebody besides Gary the disconnect is not with Jesus okay the disconnect is with us we need to be before God on our faces saying God is there something in my life that needs to go is there some area of my life that is unsanctified Is there some attitude that is not under the blood? That's where we've got to get. And we've got to stay there. We can't just get there tomorrow and then be out from under it the next day. We have to get there and abide there. And if we can do that corporately, we will have heaven come down here. We will have the power of God in such abundance that we won't know what to do with it. We won't be having to have some monkey shines where some preachers stand down here in the altar trying to get you to fall down by pushing on you. You'll be falling down when you walk in the door of this place because the power of God will come upon us. The power of God will come upon us if we will align ourselves with God's purpose. How do we do it? First of all, we have to commit ourselves to prayer. Now listen to me. I'm not talking about some formalized, ritualized, I'm going to pray at 6 a.m. every morning, because no, you won't. The flesh fails. It's weak. You will set your alarm, and, and your body will doze, okay? I'm talking about prayer becoming an attitude of your life. Everywhere you go, everywhere you are, every moment of the day, I'm in the car, I've got a spare 10 minutes here, I can pray. I'm on my way to work, I've got a spare 20 minutes here, I can pray. I've got a few minutes here at lunch where I've left over time. I can pray. I can pray. I can pray. You need to start saturating your life and the lives of everyone you know in prayer. That's number one. Nothing is ever going to happen until that starts happening. That is number one. Okay? Number two, you've got to start doing this. You're going to have to grit your teeth and do it. You have to start speaking the truth in love. 
when you hear other people with attitudes that are inappropriate, saying things that are inappropriate, doing things that are inappropriate, you need to speak. For God's sake, and for the sake of the church, and for the sake of the soul of that person, you need to speak. You know, there are kids in this church, I'm going to tell you right now, there are teenagers in this church that need you to earnestly plead with them and look at them and say, do you know that you're in danger of hellfire? Do you know that you're in danger of hellfire? If you were to die this moment, you would bust hell wide open? Do you realize that there are people in this church that need to hear you say that? People that you're close to, people that you say you love, how can you say you love them if you won't speak the truth to them? When you are around a brother or a sister and they're speaking evil and they're speaking things against people and they're speaking gossip, you're, the first word out of your mouth needs to be, have you spoken to them about this? Because if you haven't, it's inappropriate for you to be talking about it in front of me. You hear me? This is the bottom line. We've got to start changing the way we do things. We cannot continue to do the same things that we've always done, expecting a different result. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. There needs to come a radical change. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. Trust me, this message this morning is not for everyone. It's not. There are people here for whom this message falls on deaf ears. You may have slept all the way through it. Okay? There are other people here uh, who are, who are going to leave mad. The message is not for you either. The message is for him who has ears to hear. Him who has ears to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying. To the church. Let's get our hearts, our lives in line with the Spirit of God so that the Spirit of God is free, free to move among us. Amen? I, I would rather, I'll tell you what, I'll say this, and I can say this with confidence. I'd rather have 50 people that I have confidence in can charge hell with a water pistol than 500 people who are disjointed and out of joint with God and each other. God, deliver us from this whole numbers game that we're caught up in. Lord Jesus, we just recognize today our need, our need, our desperate need. I recognize my need, my need. I need to hear what your voice is saying, and I need to obey. Regardless of what everyone else does, I need to obey you. I need to obey you. I need to be instant in that obedience. I need to be, respond to what the Spirit of God is saying to the churches. Give me ears to hear. And give me a heart that is quick and willing to respond.